Hey, welcome to the Greenhouse. I'm Alex. It's March 8th, it's International Women's Day, and like we did last year, I want to take you with me behind the scenes so that you can see what I do on a typical day. Now, if you watch our Greenhouse videos, you can tell that I'm in Paris again. And the reason I'm here is because my partner and colleague does environmental science research in collaboration with the University of Paris and the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris. So we're gonna go there this afternoon, but first, we're going to the Natural History Museum. Okay, so as usual, we're working on more than one film at once. Today, we're at the Mineralogy Museum because we wanna talk about the importance of trace components in the environment. Now, um, we're gonna do that with our five senses. We're gonna do sight, sound, touch, smell, taste. And in the Mineralogy Museum, we're gonna be able to see some examples of visually how important tiny amounts of contaminants or trace elements are in minerals. So, let's go. For example, the mineral corundum is made of aluminum and oxygen. It's a really tough material. It's number nine on the mineral hardness scale, just below diamond, which is a 10. That makes it good for everyday uses like making sandpaper. A pure corundum crystal with only aluminum and oxygen is colorless. However, in the natural world, few things turn up in pure form. Transition metals, those elements that fall in the middle of the periodic table, are common impurities in corundum, and they do amazing things. For example, adding some chromium turns a colorless corundum crystal into a vibrant red ruby. Swapping a chromium for an aluminum changes the shape of the crystal lattice and makes light behave differently when it strikes the crystal. Red is reflected and the other colors are absorbed. You only need about 4,000 parts per million chromium to turn corundum ruby red. What if, instead of swapping in chromium, we swap in titanium and iron? Do you know what happens then? Sapphires! And this is really cool. You need both titanium and iron, but you only need 0.01% of the aluminums replaced. That's 100 parts per million. So this really is a big response to a small change. Last, let's look at the diamonds. Diamonds are, of course, pure carbon, and here, even tinier transition metal impurities can make a big difference. It only takes one part per million boron to make a diamond blue. One part per million nitrogen turns it yellow. There can also be crystal defects, missing atoms in the crystal lattice that make diamonds pretty much every other color. So, if you're wowed by all the gems and you've forgotten why we're here, we're thinking about the importance of trace concentrations, especially the importance of trace gases in the atmosphere or any trace contaminant in the environment, because a little bit can have a big impact. The Natural History Museum is just across the park from the University of Paris. This campus is home to the science departments, and in the early 20th century, it's where Marie and Pierre Curie worked when they were exploring the properties of radioactivity. Today, the campus is named for them. Since it's Women's History Month and International Women's Day, let's go take a look at Marie's lab. First, we'll go check in on some geochemist colleagues and look at their research, and then we'll meet up with Jérôme Gaillardet, a professor here. Hey Madeline, what you doing? I'm running the multi-collector here. It's a mass spectrometer, and we're looking at calcium isotopes. <laughs> this is where you want to hit it. Oh yeah, right there. <laughs> because you're um, right. Yeah. So because you don't have very good resolution, we only have like four A and you, but um, yeah, I think we got it. <laughs> hey Lou. Let's go see if we can find your own. Maria Skodowska was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1867. Because women were not allowed to enroll in universities in Poland, Marie came to the University of Paris in 1891, where she earned bachelor's and doctoral degrees. Her lab in the Curie Pavilion is owned by the city of Paris, and it's open to the public, but you've got to make an appointment, which I did. But since there are lots of students and postdocs at the IPGP who have never been here, they're all coming along today. So when we decided here, so we were allowed to destroy everything, but this building was, was to keep, was to be kept intact, you know, because it's protected by the family. So the family Curie, the family Langevin, because as you know, uh, Marie, uh, Marie's daughter married, uh, married uh, Jovio, and then they had, you know, and it's uh, 
dynasty of uh, physicians. Uh, and, this, and so this is protected. It belongs to the Ville de Paris. It doesn't belong to us. So this is why it's so difficult, so difficult to come here. Uh, and Ville de Paris gave us the money to rework it and to to um, build, rebuild it as it was. Um, as it was. So we, we based uh, we reconstruct based on these photographies. It's a strange uh, idea to take a picture of, uh, of your lab when it just exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is what, what it was like when Marie was working here. So we, nothing is original. The, the people that did that went to the Lepus, Lepus is the market. The free market. <laughs> the free market. The market. And, the, and they found you know, things, objects, which mm -hmm. look like the objects that Marie Curie was using. Marie Curie worked in this lab and became the only person to be awarded two Nobel Prizes in science. Her daughter, Irene, is also a Nobel laureate. Marie discovered two new elements, radium and polonium, and her fundamental work on the nature of radioactivity changed the way we understand the world. Her other accomplishments may be less familiar. For example, during the First World War, she built a mobile radiograph unit that she took into the field to x-ray and diagnose the needs of wounded soldiers in order to get them better care. None of this would have come to pass if the University of Paris had not been open to women students and later to appointing Marie as their first woman professor. Marie Curie, Marie Curie is very famous in China. It's very famous in the US. Famous in the The symbol of, uh, how to say, women in science. Um, integration, you know, yeah. when you come from a foreign country and then you become French. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, looking around the room here, scientists still come from all over the world to work in Paris, including me. So these are some of all the different things that are part of my day. But on this International Women's Day, living in Europe, I've got one more errand to do. So it's March. 2022, and I would love to stay focused on the things where I have expertise on education, on the environment, but it's hard to improve education or the environment if we have no peace.